Good morning, it's good to be here. Glad to see all your friendly, happy, smiling faces. In Psalm chapter 95 and verse 6, the psalmist says, O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for He is our God. And we are His people, the people of His pasture, and the sheep of His hand. Today, if you will hear His voice, do not harden your hearts. We're here this morning to hear a portion of the Word of God, and it is our prayer that none of us will have hearts hardened to the things that we read and study about this morning. I'd like to call your attention as we begin the lesson today to Romans chapter 13 and the first five verses. Within this passage of scripture, we have three principles of life authored and set into motion by Almighty God. That's Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 5. Read with me, if you will. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the saint. For he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister and avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Therefore you must be subject not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. Here in this passage, as I mentioned, Romans chapter 13, a passage that we always turn to in reference to the role of government in God's overall plan for humanity. There are certain principles under which governments must be conducted and their business conducted in order to be pleasing to God. I want to pick out three principles that are mentioned within this context that certainly apply to the government, but they're also more general in making application to virtually every aspect of our life. The principles we're going to discuss this morning have to do with the government and with every aspect of our life as individuals, as a congregation of God's people, as family members, and so on and so forth. There's no area of life in which we can escape what God requires of us. There's no escape from God's authority. Which is the first principle I want to discuss, taken from this passage in Romans 13. One of the principles stated there very plainly is that God is sovereign. In other words, God has a right to expect obedience. He has a right to command others. Even the leaders of great and mighty nations, God has a right. He has a sovereign right. The authority of God is also expressed in His Word. And it's brought out in His context, which is part of God's Word in reference to how government is to con uh, conduct their business, what their attitude toward good people and bad or evil is to be. And they are to direct their business according to that principle, because it's based on the sovereign authority of Almighty God. It's a principle that's very important in government and in all aspects of our life. A second of the three principles that I want to draw out of this passage is that the governments are to praise that which is good and to execute God's wrath against the evil. This is a principle that applies not only to government, because all people under all circumstances are supposed to praise that which is good. We are supposed to praise good people. We are to praise good things. We are to praise the Word of God and everything that reflects a respect and an admiration and obedience to the Word of God. 
So there's always to be praise for people, for things that are good. This is again designed by God and put into place by God. And it's the principle that we need to follow in our lives, in government and individuals. There is also to be wrath against evil. God will execute vengeance in his own time and in his own way eventually. That's not our part to play. But on certain levels, we do have to condemn evil. And we have to make sure we're staying up for what's right. And making sure that within the area of response that God has granted to us, that we are ex executing or uh, talking about wrath against evil. We are discussing that and we're making sure that uh, people know where we stand and stand against evil and in favor of that which is good. It's, yeah, again, it's a principle of life that God has laid down. Third principle taken from this context, which applies generally, is subjection to authority. All people are to be in subjection to the authority of God. Ultimately. And in that context, in Romans 13, we are and have a discussion there, respect for the authority of governments. And there's other passages that also talk about the respect and obedience that we ought to have for those who are governing us. And again, it applies to the government, but it also applies to all areas of life. So these three principles that are brought out in Romans chapter 13 are brought out in many other passages throughout the Word of God. We deal with these principles. The principle of God's sovereignty and God's authority that must be respected by all at all times. The principle of praise for that which is good and wrath or punishment for that and those who are evil. And then subjection to authority. All people live under subjection to God and subjection to the government and it's subjection to those who are over us in many capacities. We're going to talk about these three principles as we continue our lesson this morning. Let's talk about, in particular, how these three principles are recognized in the area, first of all, of government. The very passage that we read specifically is addressed to government, having to do with government authority, our attitude toward government authority, how government is supposed to execute their authority, how their authority is to be uh, considered by those who are citizens of this particular country or any country. But we notice that governments do not always respect these principles of life when it comes to recognizing God's authority and praise for good, wrath against evil, and subjection to authority. Individuals who control the governments at any given time, they're going to promote a type of government that reflects their spiritual well-being, their understanding of God's Word and their attitude toward God's Word. So in reference to these three principles in the government, we see many perversions and miscarriages of these principles. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 16, and you can go throughout the entire Bible, the Old or the New Testament, and find perversions or miscarriages of God's justice, of the principles under which governments are to, to conduct their business. What we have there in Matthew chapter 2 is the command of uh, King Herod the Great, the king of Judea, who issued the declaration of all the innocent Infants in Bethlehem were to be slaughtered in his effort to destroy the Messiah. That was a perversion of his role as the head of the government in Judea. He had no right to disobey God's law and commit a sin in God's eyes against innocent people. So again, you see a perversion of all three of these principles in this action that King Herod took. He shows a disrespect for God's sovereign and God's authority. He shows a disrespect for, to praise that which is good 
He wanted to kill innocent babies and went forth with that uh, that goat. His wrath was not against evil, it was against innocence. And he did not put himself in subjection to God, to rule in such a way that God requires, that God has commanded. So we see in that, we also see persecution against the apostles throughout the New Testament, where Peter and John, who were preaching the word of Christ on the streets of Jerusalem in Acts chapters 4 and 5, they were arrested, and they were beaten, they were threatened, they were told, do not preach the name of Christ in this city again. They said we must obey God rather than man. So they refused to obey the perverted commands of the governing authorities back at that time. And throughout the New Testament we see persecution against Christians, against that which is good. In disregard of God's sovereignty and God's authority, showing a lack of respect for God's authority. So those who persecuted Christians, whether they were the Jewish authorities or later on the Gentile authorities, they were disrespecting these principles of life that God laid down for them. And they were perverting God's justice. But we see current examples in our own day and age of the perversion of justice in reference to all three of these principles. There are pro-abortion laws that began legally in 1973, when Roe versus Wade was passed, where since that time, 62, it's estimated 62 million innocent, unborn children have been put to death in very violent fashion. And it's legal. But being legal doesn't make it right. That was a showing a lack of respect again for God's sovereignty, God's authority. It was certainly not praising that which is good, what could be more good than an innocent child, an innocent baby, even an unborn child. And they were again showing no subjection to God's authority when they came up with this law. God's law, God's word, was not under consideration by the lawmakers when they established that law. There's a lot of neglect of government limitations. And I'm not talking about just with respect to the Constitution of the United States. It indicates there's certain limited rights that the government has that they far exceed. But I'm talking about governments neglecting the limitations of government that God placed upon them, which are referred to, I think, in Romans chapter 13. What is the primary role of government, according to Romans chapter 13, uh, in God's view, is to protect the innocent and to execute wrath against the evil. But we see just the opposite happening so often in our day and age, where wicked people, where lawbreakers are being praised, are being uh, allowed to go free with their law breaking, their violence, their destruction, their killing even. And on the other hand, good people are being hampered by the government. Our rights are being taken away. They're doing just the opposite. In respect to praising good and executing wrath against evil, they're punishing good people and they're praising that which is evil. And we see it right in front of our very eyes. There is in our government, by virtue of legislation that's being passed now, and over has been for the past 40 or 50 years, a move towards socialism. Socialism is the front door to communism. I recently read a book entitled The Devil and Karl Marx, in which Karl Marx and Frederick Engels, among others, who were the ones who wrote the textbook for communism, they actually pointed out that socialism was the entryway into communism. But beyond that, and more importantly than that, they pointed out that communism and religion have absolutely nothing in common. So the closer we come in socialism to communism, the farther away we're going to get from God's Word. Who foisters communism upon the people other than the government? When they abuse their authority that God has given to them, when they refuse to acknowledge God's sovereignty and God's authority, when they continue to 
praise that which is evil and execute wrath against that which is good. When they refuse to be in subjection to God's authority as expressed in His Word. We see that in governments over and over again. In our culture, violence and anarchy are praised. Law-abiding citizens are condemned and it seems to be getting worse and worse. So as we think about these three principles of life, how they relate to government, we know according to God's word what the primary role of government is from God's eyes, to protect the innocent and to execute wrath or punish those who are evil. They're doing that just the opposite. They say that uh, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. People who are in important roles in government, who make our laws, they have a certain amount of authority. Sometimes it goes to their head. And they assume too much authority. They assume God's authority to make laws that contradict God's law for them. So we can see in government many abuses and many miscarriages of these three principles of life as they are, are related to government. But these three principles not only relate to government, as our text points out, these three principles of life also relate to, well, I forgot to read another passage there that uh, corresponds or is uh, parallel to Romans 13, and since I've got it on there, I'll go ahead and read it. 1 Peter 2, verse 13 through 17, in reference to our attitude toward government, says, Therefore submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king as supreme or to governors, as to those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. For this is the will of God that by doing good you may be you may put to silence ignorance of foolish men, as free yet not using liberty as a cloak for vice, but as God's servants of God. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Sometimes our local governments, federal governments, make it very difficult to honor those who are in authority and to submit ourselves to their authority as God requires. Because government has a responsibility to govern in such a way as God has laid out in his word. But we continue in reference to these three principles of life and consider how they relate to the home. In Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 4, the passage says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you, and that you may live long on the earth. And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. This passage lays down some basic principles, principles of life, upon which our family, our home life, is to be based. We might also turn to Titus chapter 2, verses 1 through 8, which goes into some detail in how the principles of Ephesians chapter 6 are to be uh, uh, followed through in our homes. Titus chapter 2, verse 1 beginning, says, and these are passages or, or words that the Holy Spirit gave to Titus through Paul in reference to family life. <coughs> Titus was left to uh, teach the church, but in teaching the church, families were being taught. And in order for church to be what it needs to be, families need to be what they're supposed to be. So the specifics of how family life is to be conducted is certainly part, an important part of teaching the local church. So there Paul writes to Titus, But as for you, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine, that the older men be sober, reverent, temperate, sound in faith, in love and patience. The older women likewise, that they be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, not giving to much wine, teachers of good things, that they admonish the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, homemakers, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. Likewise, exhort the young men to be sober-minded, in all things showing yourself to be a pattern of good works, 
In doctrine, show integrity, reverence, and corruptibility, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that one who is an opponent may be ashamed, having nothing evil to say of you. Even those young people, the young men that are being addressed, beginning in verse 6 there, are to be admonished. I think this admonishment in verse 6 is particularly aimed toward uh, Timothy, where verse 7 says, In all things, showing yourself to be a pattern of good works. But if pattern of good works is to be emulated by the other young men, as Timothy himself is considered to be a young man, in their everyday life and in their behavior. So young men are sometimes a very focal point of violence and crime and rebellion and things which are bad in society. The young men are to be sober-minded. They are to be a pattern of good works. They are to, in doctrine, to show integrity, reverence, and incorruptibility. They are to be sound in speech, that their speech be not condemned. And when they have opponents, their opponents may be ashamed because they have nothing evil to say against such young men. Also, young women are to be taught by the older women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, homemakers, good, obedient to their own husbands. That again in their life, and by virtue of their influence, the word of God will not be blasphemed. Older women themselves are to be reverent in their behavior, not slanders, not given to much wine, and teachers of good things. And older men are to be sober, reverent, temperate, sound in faith, in love, and in patience. To be an example to all others in the congregation. Also within the immediate family, in the extended family, in the neighborhood. All these qualities are instituted by God that pertain to family life. So there are many passages in the Word of God that talk about the need for the home to be conducted under the principles of life that we're discussing this morning. We are in our home required to recognize God's sovereignty and God's authority. The commands that we give our children, the example that we give to them in our behavior, all is to be in subjection to God's authority. Our thoughts, our words, our actions, our behavior, our influence is to be filtered through God's word and changed and modified through God's word. That we might be a good influence of God, the influence upon others. We within our home are to praise that which is good and execute wrath or punishment against that which is evil. When our children do something good, we should praise them. When they do something bad, we need to punish them or teach them, discipline them in whatever appropriate way is necessary to teach them not to do that which is evil in God's eyes again. And that subjection to authority. In Colossians, where the Apostle Paul talks about subjection to authority, he says, be subject to all men. And then he goes on specifically to talk about why being subjection to their husbands. Children being subjected to their uh, parents. And so on and so forth. So these principles of life certainly apply to the home. And it should be our desire as members of families, as we all are, to conduct our family life according to God's principles of life. But you know, just like in government, we see many perversions in family life in our day and age. In the home, we see what we refer to now as dysfunctional families. This, of course, is not a new thing. Dysfunctional families go all the way back to the very beginning. The family of Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, in Cain's murder of his very brother, was certainly a dysfunction in that family and an abuse of God's law. Jacob and Esau were treated with favoritism by their parents. Joseph was raised up in a family where that was cursed by favoritism as well. He was sold into slavery by his own brothers. So dysfunctional families go back as far as families go back. Family duties today, the duties that parents have toward children, are being disregarded according to God's principles because many times we turn the duties of raising our children over to society to the point where the government provides food, the government provides care, 
the government provides a teaching, we turn everything over to society or to some government program. We allow them to raise our children for us. And there are families out there, in many cases because of negligent fathers, who have uh, sired children but have run off and deserted them. And a mother is left with uh, the inability to raise her children. Sometimes she has to turn to the government for help. And as a result of that, more often than not, children are raised not only cared for by the government, but their ideals are based upon government uh, and societal uh, conditions or uh, standards. And in reference to children, look what the government is doing or families are allowing to be done with their children. We hear every week virtually about some elementary school child who wants to become a transgender individual. A little boy who's encouraged that he wants to be a girl. A little girl who's in different ways, directly and indirectly, encouraged, well, she may not realize, maybe I'm not supposed to be a girl after all. The boy says, maybe I'm not supposed to be a boy after all. I think I'll try to be a girl or try to be a boy uh, and be different. And this affects children who have low self-esteem, who are not popular, who for whom life is not going along like they expect or like they want. Instead of going to their family, they're going to uh, people in school in, in some occasion. And I know some uh, school systems are a lot worse than they are here in Chesterfield County. And I get in trouble a lot when I talk about teachers and teaching and so forth. Because I might observe something in the news as a national or maybe it's coming out of New York or Northern Virginia or California, and I sometimes make leave the impression that's going on here, and then a teacher or an administrator will come up to me and say, you know, that doesn't describe our school, not where my kids go to school. And I don't doubt them. I hope that they're, uh, that's true, that these things are not uh, happening in every school district, that some principals and administrators have enough sense not to go along with all these far out, far left societal uh, changes in reference to children. But it is happening, and it'll probably come to a school close to us at some point. But these, uh, this teaching, this understanding of life, uh, has to be based upon God's Word, not upon what society said, or programs that the government, the school system might come up with. Children need to be taught in the home what's right and wrong. As we've read there from Ephesians chapter 6, what does it tell fathers to do? Raise up your children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. We can't allow the government or the schools or the society, the neighbors or the community to take that responsibility away from us or to allow them to uh, overcome our influence over our child. It's a parent's responsibility to make sure they're teaching their children the right things and that their children are being kept away from influences that will take them in another direction. And that their children are taking their instructions seriously. So society is teaching our children to disregard parents, to disregard good traditions, and to disregard God and God's Word. And in this, in these perversions, in these miscarriages, they are going against a respect for these three principles of life. God's sovereignty and God's authority to decide how children are to be taught, how homes are to be conducted, parents' responsibility toward children and children's responsibility toward parents. Society, again, is praising those things which are evil, which are perverted. And they are condemning those things which are good in reference to family life and home life. And bottom line is, they're not showing subjection to God's authority as revealed in His Word. But we move on and consider these three principles of life as they pertain to the church. Those of us who are members of the body of Christ are members of the local congregation. And the church universally, the church generally, as well as individual congregations, must submit to God's authority in reference to the church. Over in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 17, and also 1 Timothy 6 and verse 3, these passages talk about a pattern. 
Brethren, join in following my example and note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. There is a pattern here. Paul is writing to the church in Philippi, teaching them that there's a certain pattern of behavior and activity, work, worship, and organization that the local church is to acknowledge and base their uh, worship and work upon. Similarly, in 1 Timothy 3, 6 or verse 3, if anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which accords with godliness. Here this passage talks about wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which accords with godliness. This covers much in the life of the church. Not just one or two things, but there's wholesome words, there's words of the Lord Jesus Christ, there's certain aspects of doctrine that apply to every aspect of the local church. And we are to recognize that as we conduct the business of this local church. But there again are many perversions. The Lord has given us in His Word certain names and descriptions of the Lord's body. Jesus said, upon this rock I will build my church. The church is the church of Christ, the Christ, church that Christ built. Acts eleven twenty six. the disciples of Christ were called Christians first in Antioch. In Romans 16, verse 16, it says the churches of Christ salute you. Furthermore, 2 Corinthians 1, and verse 1, describes the church as the church of God. Colossians 1, 13, as the kingdom of God. 1 Timothy 3, 15, as a household of God. So these are our description, descriptive terms described in the church. In Ephesians chapter 5, the church is referred to as the bride of Christ. So there's different descriptives given to the word of God that describe for us what the church is from different perspectives. The church is the head of the body. The church is the bride of Christ. The church is the household of God. The church is the kingdom of God. The church is the church of Christ. And we ought to acknowledge the descriptions that the word of God is given to the church. We have to abide by those and recognize that there's no room for denominational names or the names of other men for the, church, the Lord's church. Even though the Lord's church will have what we might call a formal name, it does have certain names by which it is referred to in certain uh, descriptions in the word of God, and we ought to honor those. The organization of the church. Philippians chapter 1 verse 1 talks about elders and deacons. Acts 14 23 says that the apostle Paul and Barnabas went and appointed elders in every church. Acts 20 verse 28, the elders are told to conduct their business in the church over which the Holy Spirit made them overseers. That authority is limited that the elders have to a local congregation. But look at all the perversions of that in the religious world today. The work of the church. We have a perfect example of the work of the church in Acts chapter 11 with regard to the church in Antioch. We know that the work of the church includes benevolence, edification, and evangelism. The church in Antioch is a perfect example of all three types of work. They were very evangelical, they were certainly benevolent, and they were edifying one another, teaching one another. All those things are mentioned in reference to the church in Antioch. But yet, the work of the church has been deferred by the religious world today, where many other works that are not included in the scriptures are being enjoined by many denominational churches today. And then the worship, of course, has been deferred as well. The worship is, of the church has been turned into a form of entertainment or a venue to entertain people instead of bring us closer to God. So there's many modern abuses to the work of the church to the worship of the church, to the organization of the church that we can see in our life and that we are warned about in the scriptures. The division of the church in Corinth, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 10, the apostle Paul condemned because they were divided, following after Paul, some after Apollos, some after Cephas, or Peter. And uh, so there were, have been perversions of God's three principles of life in the church. And whenever a church it diverts its work or worship from the organization, from the Word of God. They are showing disrespect for God's sovereignty and God's authority. They are praising their own work instead of God's work. And they are 
refusing to subject themselves to God's authority. So these three principles of life apply to the church as well. They need to be acknowledged. Then finally, we recognize that the three principles of life under which we are discussing today apply to individuals and how we live as individual Christians. Turn, if you will, to John 6, 69, and look at the uh, PowerPoint. Also, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. What is an individual responsibility to do? Every individual has a responsibility to do this, to believe in Jesus Christ, and to know that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. God has given that responsibility to all mankind. James 1, 27 says, Pure and undefiled religion before God the Father is this, to visit the orphans and widows in their trouble, and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. We have the responsibility as individual to believe Christ, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and to keep ourselves pure or unspotted from the world. That's the responsibility, a chore that God has given to all individuals. And in John 15, 1 through 6, Jesus talks about the vine and the branches. And we as branches need to abide in the true vine. Jesus says in verse 5 down there, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire. And they are burned. Individual Christians have the responsibility of abiding in Jesus Christ. These are duties that we have. And of course we know there's all sorts of abuses. When it comes to individuals not living their life according to the principles of God's word. These three principles. Recognizing God's sovereignty and God's authority. Praising that which is good and punishing that which is evil. Or expressing wrath against that which is evil. And subjecting to authority. What are some of the abuses? Pride, arrogance, people worshiping other gods, people worshiping money, people following science in such a way that they worship science or social causes. I don't have to worship God because I'm trying to keep the uh, climate clean and uh, take care of the earth. I know God will accept that. In total neglect of what God actually tells us to do. So we can see abuses when it comes to the individual lives of people in reference to these three principles of life. When we, through our pride and through our arrogance, turn our back on God, refuse to obey and acknowledge His Word, and show total disrespect for His authority and the Word through which His authority is expressed. In conclusion, these principles cover every aspect of life. The principles in which we need to recognize God's sovereignty and God's authority. We should always and recognize that all things, all people are to praise that which is good and exercise or exclaim wrath against evil. That all of God's creation are to be subjected to His authority and on different levels of authority as well as God's Word instructs. And so we cannot escape the need to live up to these principles of life that God has laid out in His Word. Nothing is left out. There are no exceptions. As we stand before God, even yet this day, we need to consider in what way have I tried to abuse or miscarry or neglect God's authority? Is there something in your life that as a child of God, most of us are Christian, that you're not obeying God in it? That you're not totally in subjection to God. That you're not in recognize, recognition of His authority, His sovereignty. Something good that you're not praying or something evil that you are indulging in. In some way, being in, not in subjection to God's authority. If there is, you have an opportunity to come to God even now. Do you not consider your life? What things you might be doing that stand between you and God that cause you to fail in these three principles? There's something you need to do to make your life right. Hopefully something in my sermon has been said that will motivate you to do that. To come to God, repent of your sins, and ask for our prayers, and ask for God's forgiveness. If you need to do this, we encourage you to do so even now. As we together stand and sing this song with you.